How's everybody doing? Woo! Woo! Dopamine's worn off from lunch. Okay, let's start with some jokes. Okay, okay. What do you call an Australian with a high IQ? Anyone? A cheat. What is the difference between an Australian wedding and an Australian funeral? One less drunk person. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So I was asked, I was, <laughs> I was asked after lunch, over lunch, if Croc Hunter was going to be making an uh, appearance. Uh, but I have a little bit of news about that. I'm actually just flown back in from Australia. I'm filming Dundee with Danny McBride and Chris Hemsworth. So I'm under NDA and I cannot share anything crocodile related. So my apologies, my apologies. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty. I had to start because I'm talking about security. So I've got to start with fun. It's, yeah. All right. So big announcement today. I want to start. This has been an exciting time for me. Um, and please let history show that I'm going to do the first presentation completely in emojis. Can I get a round of applause? So can anybody guess on the second line? That's a lock and a key. A locky. Locky. That's my name. Right, so securing Helm, Locky, and Azure containers. I could only get a box. I couldn't get a container upstreamed in time in emoji land. So we're going to go through this thing completely in emojis. Is everybody going to be okay with that for a security talk? Yeah. Fantastic. No, I'm not, but that was my dream. So unfortunately, uh, it, one day that dream will be realized. So if anybody has any extra cycles to help me get those emojis upstreamed, I would be forever grateful. So I'm going to be talking about securing Helm. Now, this was a, when I put the CFP in, it was a journey of discovery the last few months, learning how to secure Helm. So it's been good fun. But come along with me. And like any good securities talk, we've got to start by framing your mind. Right? So does anybody know SPAF? SPAF is a security guru. But uh, if you're talking about security, the only truly secure system is one that's powered off, cast in an iron block of concrete and sealed in a lead, room, lead, lead line room with armoured guards. So that's basically all I have to say about securing Helm. Thank you. No. <laughs> okay, okay. So I, I think I've got it down to one slide though. So let me drop a little bomb here um, in my discovery that uh, I would go to say that Helm is only as secure as the cluster that is, it is installed on, right? So let's dig into that. But I've got the caveat there, mostly. So we will dig into that bit. But I wanted just to highlight, a lot of people are excited about Helm being secure, but there's no use in having secure Helm if the rest of your cluster is unsecure. So in my journey of discovery, does anybody have everything on this list ticked off? Because if you do, give me a CFP. I'll make sure you're on stage in Copenhagen. Um, but there is a lot of pieces to securing your Kubernetes cluster. And that's just a fact. These are all great tools, and you can do it. But there's a lot to getting your Kubernetes cluster secure. So when it comes to securing home, let's not put the cart before the horse. Um, let's not get too excited about securing Helm. And I'm going to dig into exactly what I found and break it all down. So a little history lesson here. Um, has anybody not used Helm, or has everybody Helm users? No, he has not used Helm. OK, you're going to be my, yeah, yeah. So just, just a quick, I want to put it into context, because I think to understand how you would secure Helm requires you to understand all the componentry that makes up Helm and how it interacts with the Kubernetes cluster or Kubernetes API. So we have the Helm client, obviously the CLI component that interacts with the server side component being the tiller. Um, and that tiller is responsible for taking commands from the CLI and inter interfacing with the Kubernetes API and actually installing those and making decisions. So I put together an architecture. I don't know if everybody can see it, but it will be available on the slide. So um, I am going to break down this diagram, but here is exactly how Helm works. So over right behind me, we have the Helm client, and we have a chart repository somewhere. The charts are fetched by the Helm client, stored locally and we then reference a cube config. So cube config is our access to the cluster. That tells the Helm client where to look up the Tiller deploy service to connect via gRPC to Tiller over there on the top right. Tiller uh, has a pod, so it's a, a deployment with a replica of one at the moment, and it's referencing a service account. This service account gives it the authority and the identity of the Kubernetes cluster to make a decision um, on how to treat those requests when it interfaces with the Kubernetes API. Uh, releases are stored, release information are stored in config maps by default. And you can release charts 
to one or many namespaces. So depending on what the contents of that chart is, you're not restricted to a single namespace, it could be many. And it could be any given resource. So any given Kubernetes resource. So just keep that in mind. Now the other thing down the bottom is we, we also have a microservice pod that could access Tiller as well, right? It's a gRPC interface, it's a service, there's nothing actually stopping that communication. And you may have processes such as CI jobs that want to talk directly to Tiller. Um, so communication paths there I kind of wanted to draw out just to get them in front of everybody and then kind of dig into each piece and how we may secure it. All right, so I think one revelation is uh, Tiller is just an app running on Kubernetes. Don't think of it as much more than that. So what, what this means to say is it only has the, uh, what Kubernetes can support as its disposal, right? It can't do too much more than that. It's no different to any other app that runs on Kubernetes. So I kind of called out here a lot, of, a lot of what people are looking at is this ideal situation where Tiller is performing actions using the rights of a client instead of the rights of Tiller, right? This is great. This isn't actually solved in Kubernetes. Right, so there is, there, there is a pod identity working group working on this problem and solving it in a generic fashion. Now think of it something like sudo or something on a Linux file system so that you can assume access to somebody else's um, identity. Right, that is not there today, so anything that we're doing obviously is going to be working around the fact that that is not a Kubernetes native problem and it may be solved one day. Right, so when we look at Helm security, I think we should take a look at what Kubernetes has at our disposal and what the Kubernetes community is working on at large, not trying to shoehorn something else in for the sake of getting it in. And finally, down the bottom, uh, solving Helm security is a community effort. Um, we're all invited, we can all come in, and we need use cases for how folks actually want the security to work in Helm and what their expectations are. So don't, you know, this is an open invitation. I don't want you to kind of sit back and think, why isn't this secure when you have great ideas and you may be able to bring them to the table. So all that being said, here's what we can do to um, secure Helm. Let's start with Kubernetes RBAC. Who has RBAC turned on? Great, great, fantastic. That's more than I was expecting. Now this whole talk's not relevant. Um, all right, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, but most people in production aren't running RBAC on. Why don't they run RBAC on? Because it's a pain in the A to configure and it gets in the way of stuff talking to the Kubernetes API. That's exactly why you want it on. But don't come looking for Helm security when you have RBAC off. Okay, this is probably fundamental, which is why I called it out very early in this conversation. So. Um, by default, Tiller will use the default service account in a namespace, right? So depending on what access you've given default will depend on what Tiller can do and what uh, CRUD operations it can perform on Kubernetes resources. So uh, I've got the command called out there, helm init dash dash service account, you give it a service account name and that will init Tiller with a given service account. I think it's important down the bottom here to call out that it does not create the service account that you're binding with, nor does it create the roles or the role bindings. So when you're thinking about Kubernetes RBAC, you need to have all these things in place to be able to do that. That's not a one command. And when folks talk about um, getting it to default, we need to think about that. One thing I want to call out is this, this kind of uh, is floating around there, out there. I wanted to break down what's happening here. But a lot of people say, I have RBAC on and I want to use Helm. What do I do? And somebody says, well, you run these three commands and you're good to go, right? So let's just wa walk through these three commands, right? So we're saying kubectl create a service account called Tiller, and then we're creating a cluster role binding. Who knows the difference between a role binding and a, a cluster role binding? Give me it. Yeah, one's namespace, the other isn't, so cluster level not. So you're saying give me a cluster role binding, so cluster wide, uh, let's call it Tiller, and let's give it the cluster role, cluster admin, um, and let's bind it to the service account, uh, cube system colon tiller, which is the service account you just created. And let's uh, helm init uh, dash dash service account tiller. So what you have effectively done is negated having our back on by giving tiller god mode. So if you have done this, that's fine, and you might want tiller to have god mode, but just understand that tiller can now operate on any resources on the cluster uninhibited. So I think just that, that those three commands, while great, you will get Helm LS to return and all your charts will install just fine. You've actually just enabled God mode with RBAC on. So negated RBAC essentially. If that's what your goal was, then feel free to run those commands. 
Um, what I want to call out down the bottom, and we just went over it, was cluster roles versus roles and cluster role bindings versus role bindings, right? One is namespaced and the other is not namespaced, meaning cluster-wide. So just be careful when you're creating these things. They do have discrete differences that you might want to understand when creating it. I'll give you some options in, in, a, in a minute. Now, finally, when we talk about Kubernetes RBAC, and I have this in the diagrams over on the right, we, we have a role binding bound to that service count and a role. Um, but what we do see some folks is actually doing multi-tiller. So tiller is not um, multi-tenant inside a single binary. Um, so you can't have different access profiles for different users at this point. I'm not sure if that's going to be something that ever happens. Uh, but what we do see is most folks grouping around either per developer, per team, or per functional environment for uh, deploying multiple tillers. I'm not sure, at Greg at Reddit, do you run multiple tillers? Not, okay. So multiple tillers kind of look like this, and if you have, the diagram's the same, just cookie cutter, but you may have a microservice namespace, and you could have the, a tiller for that microservice that is bound only to that microservice, uh, only that namespace. So that would be a boundary in RBAC that you could enforce. And obviously, um, getting access to that tiller would, um, we're reading in a cube config on the client side, right? So as long as that, that customer or that user has a given cube config mapping them to that namespace, you will land at the right tiller, you will look up the right tiller, and you will only be able to install resources. Now, finally, just to make this e easier, I'm going to call out Michelle's wonderful plugin um, here. So if you are interested in bootstrapping, um, uh, the RBAC roles and resources and Tiller at the same time. So there are quite a few things that you would need to do there. Michelle's actually wrapped this into a nice little plugin uh, which, which takes care of all of this on your behalf. And given time, if you want a demo, I, I can uh, feel free to come and see me. Uh, but basically, it will take some predefined set of roles and role bindings, create a service account, and actually bootstrap Tiller the right way to a given namespace. So all those things that I just discussed are boiled down to one command. So thank you, Michelle. Um, it makes it m much easier. Yeah, a round of applause for Michelle. I do want to highlight that plugins are a great way to actually vet uh, new changes to Helm without getting them into the core code base. So if you're interested in securing Helm in a different fashion, plugins are a great way to start, and then you can take that functionality, and if you think it, it needs to go in core, you actually have something that runs out of the box, and then you can go make a case to the maintainers. Um, they much rather work in code um, and, and seeing an implementation. All right, second off, we go down and we take a look at the release information. So release information is stored in config maps. Are config maps where you put secret information in Kubernetes? Pop quiz? No, no. You put them in secrets. Okay, so Helm can act, Tiller can be configured to store its release information in secrets rather than config maps. That is done via a, a rather obscure override at the moment, but it's just feeding in a, a flag to, the, to Tiller to say use secrets. And then, obviously, once you're in the secret realm, you can encrypt secrets at rest. There are ways to do that out of the box in Kubernetes today. And in 1.10 and beyond, that will be plugged into cloud providers and different HSMs as well. So, obviously, your release information. And I think also another important thing is um, security boundaries. So there's a lot of work in pod identity to saying only a pod that has access to mount that secret will have it. That will obviously be not something that's um, done to config maps. It may be. So this is a very quick w win when you bootstrap Tiller, you can put the release information because that does contain all your artifact history for the releases. So quick win there. Moving on to chart repos, and I think it's a good, uh, good part of the day now uh, because we've had a lot of chart repo folk and I think I, um, I've, the link's up there um, for chart museum. But basically for chart repos, you are not bound to using HTTPS. Please create your repos with HTTPS. Um, and for those that don't know, it, uh, the repo add command, you can actually, for a given repo, tell it client certificates. So if you want to enable MTLS, you can actually use client certificates on HTTPS as well. So that's another way you could add auth. Now, Chart Museum supports basic auth, and uh, Quay App Registry actually supports a myriad of different auths. Jimmy's over there. If you want to talk to him, he'll be able to help you uh, get there. But there are other ways that you can have secure chart repos. Um, I skipped over at the top, signing charts. So um, if, is anybody signing charts or using the provenance today? So yes, yes, okay. 
So you can actually ch uh, sign charts and have PKI and have trust in place to say that only uh, charts signed by this key I will trust and I will install. So if you have a CI system pushing charts up, only the CI system has access to that key and then I will only trust that key. It's like code signing certificates. Everybody uses those too, right? Yeah, yeah, big, big users, big users. The, the facility is there and it's not terribly difficult. It's built on PGP, um, so any key base users, it's extremely easy to set up. But if you sign them, it means that nobody's jumped in the middle and meddled with them and changed the contents and put something rogue in. Whoever has published the chart, you can make sure that it's intact and hashed and that it's secure. All right, uh, moving on to gRPC. So the main interface to connect to Tiller is gRPC. Um, at the moment. Now, you can use TLS on your gRPC. So Helm supports this out of the box. You can provision Tiller with a set of certificates and a CA. Um, what this does for the user is now puts a layer of identity on top of the request coming in via gRPC. Right, so each Helm client could have a client certificate per user or one per microservice team. But then you're saying that uh, only people with access to that certificate have access to that tiller and to talk to it. Now, all the documentation that I've seen out with privilege escalation attacks in Helm and Tiller are always that use case down on the bottom right where we have a pod already running that can connect directly to the, the pod, not going via the service, doing a port forward. If you do not have the certificates, that configuration is not available. Um, if you do, you're just fine. All right, so uh, taking a look at this, I've got most of it green, um, and feel free to reference this, uh, but we've actually taken all those flows and done the best that we can to secure each of the elements. You can take this and cookie cut it. I do have uh, demos as well, so, um, but I will just open source them at the end so you can rerun through all this at your own leisure afterwards. I want to be mindful of the time here. So one question I was asked last week when I said I'm securing Helm was, well, can you just secure it by default? And when you think about what does it mean to secure it by default, it's to turn all those things on. Would Helm be usable if you told everybody they had to cut certificates and have signed charts? And Maybe, but it would definitely be a higher barrier to entry, right? So the documentation out there calls out, you know, we are by no means making it secure by default today. Um, but you could see how you might want to. I think the interesting decision there is I have, you know, are these really Helm's decisions to make, right? So please have R back on, otherwise Helm will not install, right? We can't enforce that, right? So, and again, you know, that's, that's kind of an abrasive change if you make that. Nobody would be able to use Helm on Minikube, for example, or it would be completely abrasive to use it. Um, so just when, when you think about secure by default, there's a lot of reasons why things aren't secure by default, and it's typically just usability and getting a nice entry. So uh, what, I w what I aimed with this talk was showing you how to secure all the components um, that make up the, the Helm interface. Now, I think one other interesting thing is, could Helm be more Kubernetes native out of the box? And I think that is a question that will be answered or most people will be interested in tomorrow. Um, so I invite you to join that. But there are a lot of things that weren't available. Helm was written what, Matt, Helm one, uh, Kubernetes 1.0, 1.1, right? So a lot of these features, CRDs, all these things weren't available. And they've only really become mature in 1.7, 1.8, so we're talking six months ago. So um, when coming in with a mindset of today and taking for granted everything Kubernetes has, maybe we can actually rely on some more Kubernetes native security out of the box. So I think that'll be interesting. It's what I'm personally looking forward to tomorrow, um, and that'll be easy to lock down. So. Before, before I wrap up here, I wanted to give you a look at some other efforts, and you can build your own here as well. So there's a, uh, a pull request by, is it Angus? Angus is here. This is Angus's pull request. So actually flipping a bit in Tiller and say that I will reject anything that is namespaced into another namespace. Right, so you can flip a bit. There's a PR there, you can build it and play with it. But Angus is off the back of his uh, uh, blog about securing Helm has actually said, these are ways that we may be able to uh, do this. And he's brought PRs as well, which is fantastic. So know that that's there. Um, he also has an operator that's similar to, we saw the Lostroma stuff earlier, that's taking a CRD as an input rather than a gRPC interface. So we're saying that the system of record for Helm is no longer the Helm client per se, it's uh, a CRD defining 
Now this is a way, obviously, the CRDs weren't available, uh, but you can actually take a look at an implementation to define a Helm, essentially a Helm install command in CRD land, right? Now the benefit of this is you can RBAC that. So if you can create a CRD or modify a CRD, you can RBAC that request. So if I, Lockie, have the permissions to create a CRD in the namespace, you could lock that down. I may not have permissions. So that's just a way I want to get the juices flowing with people who have vividly interested in this. Now here's, here's the money maker. Um, this was one that was thrown at me last week off the back of that tweet, which was an RBAC proxy. Has anybody used the RBAC proxy? So the, there's somebody at CoreOS, I believe, wrote an RBAC proxy. It's open source. Um, Fred Brantz, I, I believe he works out of Germany. Um, but basically, he will intercept every gRPC request and validate it against either the token review or the subject act access review before hitting Tiller. So you can actually stop a request before it hits Tiller based on access, right? And he, in, inside gRPC, it's so granular, you can actually break down what's been serialized and, and say that these things are allowed and these things are not allowed. Absolutely granular. I was hoping to give you a demo of that, um, and, and I have it up and running if you want to take a look, but it, it takes a, a little bit to get through. So basically, how this would work is you would sit this cube proxy in front of the Tiller service, um, the Tiller pod, essentially. So any traffic coming into the Tiller service would hit the RBAC proxy. The RBAC proxy would call out to the Kubernetes API and ask for either token review or subject access review, get a yes, no, and then actually let that flow through to Tiller. So that's on the wire, you're getting an access granted or denied before you even hit the service. An extra layer of security there. If you're really interested in that, it's experimental at the moment, but I see other applications for this. Um, it supports not only gRPC, but HTTPS, um, HTTP as well. Um, other efforts, so Adam actually has a plugin as well. Um, and this plugin actually just runs Tiller locally, right? So you have Tiller then using your kube config as a user, um, rendering the templates locally before pushing. So they'll go under your authentication as a user. You can go pull that down today. Um, Adam has, Adam's here as well. So if you want to ask Adam about that, but you have Tiller running um, client side, right? It renders the templates, then uses your own cube config rather than a service account. So identity is intrinsically linked to you. Um, and I just wanted to call out, I added this Tillerless Helm. It's essentially the same thing as the local, but you vendor in the Tiller libraries and actually have it render the assets and then use your Cube config file before you submit it to the Kubernetes API. So that's about moving Tiller locally rather than having it run remotely on a, on a cluster. All right, so what's next? Um, I invite you all to come and help solve this problem. By no means is that everything that you can do. There are more, but I wanted to give you an idea. Plugins are a great way to get started. So if you want to do this, Adam obviously did the, the Helm local stuff in the form of a plugin. If people think that that's a valid way to run Tiller, maybe it will become a core piece of functionality one day. Uh, and the Helm 3, 3.0 proposals are tomorrow, so feel free to come in and join if you have a vivid interest in how that security might be handled. So I have references, um, and I will give a demo uh, repo as well if you want to perform everything that I did. Um, it'll be open source. So finishing, starting on emojis and finishing on emojis, I want to say thank you, and I'll open it up to questions. No questions? More jokes? jokes. <laughs> One question over here. Justin. Yep. How do you think um, a security auditing might be implemented in this sort of a infrastructure? So the question was, how do I think security auditing would be um, implemented in this infrastructure. So using the audit resource in Kubernetes, you could actually say what calls you want to audit and pump them out. Have you used the audit audit stuff inside Kubernetes? So there's a resource where you could define what you want to pull out and have it all backed by RBAC. So who asked for what, when, and why? You may be able to hook in that to the front end of Tiller as well and actually say, I want to... Um, but you could rely at a very low level on RBAC calls. So what has Tiller asked 
and what has Tiller tried to create and then log those denies from a specific source. So I think maybe audit the, the audit resource is a great place to start with our back on. Anyone else? Fantastic. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon and feel free to come and find me if you have any questions.